everybody, Jason Spangler here, the Santee Swapper. Wanted to film a video showing you a project that I'm right in the middle of because I think some of you might be kind of curious to see this. I know that there's only a few of you probably chasing after a name and number set, but that's the project that I'm working on right now. And I think that every collector has a decision to make. They can decide what they want to collect, how they want to collect it. And so I have been kind of on a long journey with this idea of collecting OA flaps from every lodge. And now I'm kind of at a real critical point. I'm kind of right in the middle of, um, I won't say finishing this project because uh, it's gonna be quite a while before I can put a pin in it, but I am at a critical juncture having just bought a huge 1500 piece OA flop collection back in January uh, that was very vintage, 1960s and 70s, nothing after 1976. And so what I've been doing is merging that collection together with my existing collection of OA flaps and then pretty much polishing it up, coming up with a needs list, making labels, all kinds of stuff going on. So I wanted to kind of just film this video to show everyone what was going on because it might be of interest to you. So let me kind of start at the beginning. Some of you will recognize this book. I got this back in the 1990s. This was a, won't quite say pocket-sized book that Roy Moore put out. But it was kind of the classic take on the Bill Price books where you had pictures of flaps with some historical information. And so I actually took this exact book to the 1997 Jamboree. And at the 1997 Jamboree, just as a visitor, I wasn't uh, um, on staff or wasn't a, a scoutmaster or anything like that, walked around. And my goal at the 97 Jamboree was to try to trade one for one for flaps from lodges in this book, one through a hundred. And so if I was to turn the page here and show you, you can see some markings in that book, whereas I went around the Jamboree, I made notes of whether or not I had traded for those flaps. And so I actually had a really nice stack of really beautiful Muskogee Lodge flaps. I had just worked at summer camp in the summer of 97, and they had a 55th anniversary flap that I was able to buy for $3 or maybe $5, whatever it was back in those days. And I took that stack of flaps and I walked around and this flap was so uh, beautiful I mean, to me anyways. Usually when I laid it down and said, I'd like to trade you this flap for that flap on your blanket, most of the time people would agree to that. And so my goal in the beginning was just to get lodges one through a hundred. Now just as kind of a little bit of history here, there are actually a lot more lodges if you go from one through a hundred than there are from 200 to 300 or any other set because all of those numbers got recycled and reused several times over through mergers and superseding and all that stuff that's happened through the history. So to say that Lodge is one through a hundred, you're trying to get one of each, it's not a hundred flaps. It, I didn't do the math, but maybe it's like 150 flaps, or maybe it's even more than that because some numbers kept getting reused over and over and over again because of mergers. So that was kind of where I started with this. In 1997. Now this was one of those collections that I really went hot and cold on because collecting lodges from uh, or flaps from every lodge was really not my passion for a long time. My passion was collecting Order the Arrow in the Carolinas starting off with my home lodge which I finished when I was in college in probably 1992 and then expanding out to collecting the rest of the state of South Carolina where I grew up and where I was living and then eventually spreading into North Carolina and trying to collect those guys as well. So that was really my focus. So going to the 97 Jamboree was kind of a one-off thing maybe starting this collection, but I kept those items. I never did trade them off or, or get rid of them. And eventually I would add uh, new ones in, especially if I got in a collection and I would go through the collection and I'd be like, oh, I don't have one of those. And I would set it aside and kind of add it in. Now, here's a point I wanna make. As you'll see in a second when I go through and show you how I'm doing this, I think everyone should decide their own rules for how they want to set up their collection. And so one of my unique rules was I grew up in the OA in the 1980s. And so the generation right before me was the generation of Swiss embroidered flaps, especially that pre Fleur de Lis. So for me, those were kind of the flaps that I really thought were beautiful, had sort of that, you know, Lion Brothers look, if you will, the three dimensional, really, you know, sharp to me embroidery. So those were the ones that I really wanted to migrate towards. So in my collection, what I tried to do eventually as I started upgrading it was to get a pre fleur de -leaf flap. In other words, a flap that was maybe middle of 1970s or prior. And I really wanted to get uh, solids. I really kind of preferred solids because 
As you know, many of the twills have a very, very simple background or, or design. And if I had a choice, it's my choice, my collection. I would rather have a beautiful, fully embroidered flap, pre fleur de lis than have a newer modern flap that was computer stitch or even maybe an older one that's just a twill with maybe a couple of three colors. Again, everybody gets to decide, so that's how I decided to do it. So let me show you a couple of these, which I actually have not kind of processed yet. What I did was, for a long time at my house, I had all of these in a binder. And because I'm kind of real picky about labels and having everything organized, this is how I originally set this up. I took the information from OA Images, John Pinnell's website, and I just cut and paste the little history data box that he had on OA Images. And then I printed it out and glued it onto this, which was what a PPS holder. Uh, you probably know Brush Creek Trading for many, many years in the 90s and into the 2000s. They had this product that was kind of the original envelope system. And so I have a ton of these from buying collections. And so that's how I had this organized. Um, this probably started back in the sometime in the 2000s when I started doing it this way. So you can see here again why this flap fits my uh, parameters. It's a pre fleur de lis flap. I think this is actually the S1, and it is uh, you know solid embroidered. So that boom, that fits right there. I also, of course, you know because I don't always or I couldn't always follow that rule. I sometimes would have things like this where here is a twill flap. And again, I have to go and see, you know, I'm not even sure just off the top of my head if there is a pre fleur de lis solid flap for this lodge. Maybe there is. I'll go and check after the video. But this is the one that I put in my collection. So sometimes if I had a twill flap, it would be a placeholder until I got a solid flap. Sometimes the twill flaps were easier, honestly, to get than the solid flaps. It just kind of depended on, on each lodge. So... This is how the collection was for a long, long time. It was in these, these holders, and I actually had them taped. The, the holder, the patches were kind of taped to a piece of cardstock, and that was in a page holder and a three-ring binder. So I had it organized originally by old regions. So I had a notebook for region one, region two, all the way. I had 12 different region notebooks, and that's how I had it originally arranged. Now, about six months ago, I started picking this uh, back up. I still had the whole box, of, just like it had been for over a decade untouched. And I had a whole tub of ones where I knew, I'd sort of kept track of what I needed. So I, if I got a collection in and I found a flap I needed, I would throw it in a bucket. But I wasn't really going back and adding to this system because I knew this system was kind of outdated and I wanted to change it. So about six months ago, I started on the project of reorganizing, reorganizing all this and really trying to get a spreadsheet that was caught up with all the changes. So several people helped me with that on Facebook. I definitely want to um, thank them. I think Mike Clinch was one especially that helped me with some data. And then several other people uh, filled me in on the different mergers and stuff that had happened over the last 10 years. Because again, I didn't really want to go back to this of having just a cut and paste from a website. I wanted to be able to make labels that kind of told the story of you know what was the totem and when was this lodge chartered and what council was it and who did they merge with and the whole thing. I wanted to have all of that wrapped around. So that was kind of my, again, I had to decide this is what I wanted to do. I and mean, even though it's gonna be very time uh, taking is, and uh, tedious to do, that's kind of what I wanted. So in the last six months, I had actually been going on eBay and buying some of my needs because I could go through and see that I had several flaps that I needed and I sort of had, I guess my excuse was that tax time was coming up, you know, the end of the year, if you run a business, if you can go ahead and spend some money at the end of the year, then those are things that you can count as expenses. So I was kind of investing uh, some of my business's money into flaps at, towards the end of the year. So I was buying from all different dealers. Uh, if any of them are watching this video, they'd probably say, oh yeah, I sold Spangler some stuff, uh, you know, a couple months ago. Um, but ironically, this is just how this collect this uh, hobby works. In January, I had just the, the, the total luck to luck into a collection that was a, an amazing collection that basically had 1,500 OA flaps, and actually it may be as many as 1,800. I'm, I'm sort of keeping track, but I haven't finished counting all of them. And this collection was all from the 60s and 70s. It stopped in 1976. And so basically, any flap 
all of those 1500 flaps, any one of them would have fit into my collection because they're all pre Florida Lee cloth back. They all, they all fit. And so what I decided to do was when I was ready to get down to the really, really nitty gritty part of organizing this flap collection and kind of redoing, going from this system to what the next system would look like, um, I decided that I wanted to take that entire collection that I bought and I wanted to go through it lodge by lodge by lodge and compare the flap that I have in my collection now, if I have one, to the choices of flaps from this collection and decide what I would keep. So let me just give an example of this. I've been working on this for weeks and here's where I am right now. Literally, I'm on Lodge 466. And so let me take this out just to kind of give you an idea of what I did. So I created a card. You'll recognize the Best Hobby page gray here. And it's sort of a bastard thing because what I did was I used the Best Hobby page gray, but then again, I was recycling these PPS holders so there you go, just to get you confused. But if you look on this card, I have labels here. One of them has the lodge name and then also historical information here if there was mergers and stuff going on. And so you, you kind of have a spot here for most flaps will fit right there. Some of them are a little bit bigger and that was how you would see this. Again, so I just take that out of the holder so you don't see the glare. So here's where I am, Lodge 466 Piedmont Council out in California, I have to decide now, is this the one I'm gonna keep for my collection or am I gonna choose from this collection that I just bought? So let's take a look. This is a good problem to have, man. In this collection, there were three flaps from that lodge, okay? Boom, 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 right here. Now, two of them are tool flaps. So these are, generally what I saw in this collection was the guy had a lot of, um, Flaps where he would have like the, the A and the B and different varieties, things like that. And then here is the solid flap that he had. So again, some of you would say, well, why wouldn't you choose the twill to go in your collection? Because that's probably the rarer one, the older one, whatever. But again, my thing is I really prefer full embroidered flaps. So for me, I'm going to go with this guy right here. So if I compare these to see which one would I keep, to me, I mean, I have to look at it a little bit closer, but to me, these are probably uh, the same issue. I don't see a difference, I don't think. Uh, well, yeah, I'm sure there is a difference, actually. I see the, the twills, the uh, alignment of the numbers and stuff like that. So I'll have to get on the computer here in a second and decide which one is an S2, which one's an S3, whatever, and decide which one I want to keep. But it's good to have choices, okay? I'll give you another one here. Let's see. So this is Lodge 467, and got a lot of choices here. Whoa, okay. So you can see the one that I have in my collection right now, and then here are all the choices I have, because in the collection I bought, there was a twill, and there was this guy right here, and there was this guy right here, which looks very similar to the one I already have. And there's this guy right here and this guy right here. So again, what I have to kind of decide is out of these, which one do I want to keep? Because in my collection, it doesn't matter. All of these are eligible. And so what I've tended to do is I've tended to kind of to make a decision, really just a quick, you know, snap of a finger decision on which one kind of looks better or which one um, would I like to see in a frame. And so, you know, this one that's very, very colorful. So if I sort of put these two side by side, so what I've been doing is I've been looking at it saying, you know, if I wanted to have a display, which flap would I want to have? Both of these, in my eyes, are qualified to fill that hole, but which one sort of pops, which one looks better? So I have not really been looking to see, is this one more valuable, or is this one more valuable, or is this the S1 and this is the S2? I really haven't focused it on that. Another thing that I've done is, and I'll see if I can find an example in this stack right here, is, yeah, here's a good example. So I also, for the ones in my collection that I'm keeping, you'll think this is strange, but again, I want to make this point. Um, you decide what the rules are for your collection. Now, for me personally, I know what's going to happen with my flap collection is, is that I'm going to put it in a display. I, might, I probably am going to mount it in these big, big uh, plywood cases that I got in this collection. If you want to see, find out more about that, if you uh, join my Patreon group, Scouting Hot Pines Insiders, 
I actually filmed like a 15 minute or 18 minute video when I got this huge collection, kind of showing these frames and showing how it looked. And so that's uh, that's inside the Patreon group. So, I, so you have to join that to, to see it. But what some of these were was on the back, there were some patches that had glue on the back. So here's the thing for me. I'm going to put these in a display on some red felt. I might even put a little stitch with a little needle and thread in the corner to hold these onto that red felt. And I don't plan on ever taking them out. This is going to be kind of a permanent display. And so for me, when it really comes down to it, this will sound really crazy to some of you. This one right here is a really good candidate for me to put in my display. Now you might think, wait a minute, why wouldn't you want to keep the most valuable one in your collection? Why wouldn't you want to keep the one that's the oldest in, in your collection. Well, here's kind of what I've settled on. Number one, all of the flaps in this collection that I got were already in displays. And I could tell by the, the by how beat up these displays were that they were well traveled. This guy had gotten around and been to a lot of scouting events and displayed these. And so in my mind, these patches have already been on display. They, that's kind of how he had it organized. And so I kind of have this little thing of like, you know, if, if it's even Steven, like if I have a choice between, this actually isn't a bad example, if I have a choice between this one right here that I've been carrying around for a while, or this one right here that came out of the display, I've been kind of leaning towards this one because it has a problem on the back anyways. So if I tried to resell it, it would kind of have a ding. But on the front, it presents very, very well. There's nothing wrong with this flap on the front and it already came out of the display, so why not put it right back in the display? And so what I've been doing is taking the one out of this holder, throwing that into the box that'll be up for resale, and then replacing it with this. I've also been making notes on a spreadsheet. I'm going through using OA Images and Patch Vault and even the old uh, Blue Book, because as many of you know, OA Images is uh, only about maybe a, mm, two thirds of the lodges. Is there any kind of a listing still left? The rest of it's all destroyed. And so I've been using the old blue book. This is the second edition from 98 to identify these because these are all really old flaps that are pretty easy to spot. And so that's what I've done. I've gone through and organized it. Let me show you a couple of them just to kind of fill you in on a couple of other little things I've decided. So this particular box here starts at Lodge 382 and it goes through, this is what I'm working on right now. So literally like there's Lodge 466 that I just finished. One of the cool things about the collection that I got is that there were some really, really good flaps in there and I'm uh, just, you know, super happy about. So let me show you one that I was super happy about. So I had to tag it so it'd make it easy to find. So this little guy right here was in this collection that I bought and there's no glue on the back of this one. It's it's pristine mint. So this is, uh, this is a Hawaiian word, y'all, excuse me. Uh, kamahi yamahi. <laughs> Uh, four, let's just call it Lodge 454. Um, and this is from the Kilauea Council in Hilo, Hawaii. Uh, it merged in 1973 with two other of the uh, Hawaii Lodges. So this is the F1. And um, this flap, here's the irony. The, the irony is that I had bought, I think from Scout Patch Auction in the last few months, I bought a Z issue, a fake issue of this lodge so that I could have it for my, my display. And um, I actually did that again here, just to kind of tell the story. I did that again here with this one from Mexico. This is actually, I think this is sort of like a historical flap, like maybe the, the lodge that emerged, you know, issued this, but it's actually kind of a Lion Brothers flap. It looks pretty good. But in the collection that I purchased, there was one of these, which is a legit straight up super hard, I don't know what the rating is on Blue Book, but this is, you know, you could you could look it up on Patch Trends. It's a it's a pretty darn good flap. So I hit a home run on some of these, and um, it was just very random. So um, for me, where I am now, I've got, and this is the other thing I want to show you guys. So what I did was I made cards, and these cards are the blanks telling me which ones I don't have. And so I've been going through, say, for example, some of you might find this interesting. What do I not have? I don't have a Lodge 448. I don't have a Lodge 447. I don't have a, this. now this I'm gonna get, I just probably didn't know it existed. Uh, a Lodge 424, the newer spelling. This will be an easy one to get. Um, I just need to find an S1 or an S2 for that. 
I don't have a Lodge 390. I don't have a Lodge 388. So there's some of the ones that you're going to see over and over that a lot of people are missing. But here's the cool thing. So I'm going through this collection. Right now I'm at like 460 something. I'm coming up on this one. So I, but prior to this collection, I did not have a War Eagle 474 in my collection. But I already know in this box, there's a 474 War Eagle. So that is literally another one that another need that I've been able to strike off the list from this collection. Um, I've, I've kind of kept track of it. I know I'm up, I'm way over a dozen. I might be getting close to 15 needs that I've gotten out of this collection, not including just the ability to upgrade and choose a better flap that I'd want to put in the collection versus the other. So um, probably when it's all said and done, I'm going to be, I think, we'll see if I'm lucky. If I'm lucky, I'm going to be down to needing about 20 flaps in order to have uh, the collection that I want. And I've already worked a deal out with someone to acquire about six or eight of the hardest ones. And it's gonna be a big deal that's gonna take maybe a year or two to kind of pull off. But uh, but that'll put me closer, that, that'll probably put me down where I need about a dozen flaps. And again, they're, they're, they're kicker ones, you know, like I need a Tomahawk, I need a Dazu. I mean, you know, you, you, know, you know the flaps I'm talking about if you chased after these hard ones. Uh, but anyways, I'm pretty excited about that. Now, here's the other, last thing I want to end with. Again, you collect what you want to collect. I have seen people um, in their, you know, name number collection where they've got to have, if the, if the Lodge made a neckerchief, but they didn't make any flaps, then they've got to have that neckerchief. Or if the Lodge made an odd shape or an arrowhead, but didn't make any Lodge flaps, then that's on their needs list. Or even getting down to this kind of craziness where... There's this replica set for, you know, fill in your blanks where lodges that never issued a patch and a lodge at some time, some years ago, made these little felt holders. So I decided a long time ago that I am really sort of of the age of collecting lodge flaps. That's what I've always been interested in. So in, in my mind, my name number collection is for lodges that have issued lodge flaps. And so that does strike off another 10 or 12 lodges that some people would, would be up in arms about, oh, you, you don't have a Gimagash, or you don't have a this or a that. But I don't, because I have decided that a long time ago, and I make no regrets about it, that it's my name number collection, and I'm only going to collect flaps. So if the Lodge issued a Lodge flap, um, and there's some killer ones who did, you know, Beluga issued a flap, and uh, Victorio issued a flap, and, uh, you know, Calusa, obviously. There's some killers, um, so I'm going to have to chase those down. So I didn't, I didn't lose all the hard ones to get, but uh, for me, that is kind of where the boundaries are. So anyways, I hope this video was kind of interesting to any of you who are interested in Order the Arrow collecting. It's very, um, it's very daunting to try to do this because when you get into the weeds of trying to collect a flap from every lodge that's ever issued one, I guess that's how I would phrase my, my collection. There's just you know, I mean, I haven't added it up, although I have a spreadsheet I could look at here. It's probably 700, 800 lodges that have issued a flap. And, you know, so many of them merged. And, blah, blah. and then there's some times where they change their name and they change their name again, change their name again. So the same lodge number is used three or four different times because they kept changing the name. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, just going down this rabbit hole of lodge flaps and lodge flap history. I do not have the kind of brain where I have just a just an instant memory of like if you said a lodge number I would tell you what council it was and when it merged and all that. I you know I probably could try really hard and memorize a, a you know a handful of them uh, if I tried to do that. So um, but it's fun to play with patches and it's fun to to organize your collection and that's really what I'm trying to do. So eventually these patches will come out of the holders and I'm going to put them into. Um, big displays. I'm going to perfect the labels. I'm really kind of uh, OCD about this. So I'm going to perfect these labels. I think I'm going to go with a bigger label that's about four inches across or five inches across and, uh, and can include all the information in one label. And I think the way I'm going to do it, it's a little hard. Once you put stuff in a frame, the real hard part is, is that it keeps changing, right? And even coming out of bankruptcy with the Boy Scouts and covid I'm sure there's going to be mergers, and so some lodges are going to go away and some new ones are going to be formed. So the way that I think I can mitigate that is, is that instead of putting together the frames by 
lodge number order, which is what most people traditionally have done. Start with lodge one, two, three, four, you know. Well, lodge numbers really don't mean anything any longer in the last however long it's been, five or 10 years, the National OA has not issued numbers and some of the newer lodges don't even recognize there being a number. And then we're right in the middle of a reorganization with the BSA where they're gonna go from having six regions, I'm sorry, four regions, to having uh, something called a territory. So they're sort of, as you know, they're combining regions and sections and kind of getting rid of all that and going with something called territories. So I think the way that I'm gonna try to do it is, I think I'm gonna put together the frames by territory because I'm, I figured that, you know, God help us for maybe the next 20 years, that'll be how the Boy Scouts have their Order of the Arrows sections arranged by territories. So if I have a frame for each territory, and then what I do in the, in the frame is I organize it by when the lodge was um, founded. So, you know, if it was the, the territory for the Carolinas, for example, uh, the oldest lodge in the Carolinas would have been Lodge 70, uh, which would be Tawatak Taki. So that would be first. And then you would go on through, down through there. So I think in Territory 16, it's going to include Virginia. Ooh, I guess Virginia would have uh, Noaqua 3. So anyways, I got already messed up. But you can kind of see the idea, like this would represent the territory, the history of the territory, and you would have all the lodges by when they were charted. So when there was a merger, obviously, you're going to have that new lodge flap in, in, in there. And I think the way that helps to mitigate change is by doing that at the very end, when I have four or five or six or eight slots left in the frame, then if there's a new lodge that's formed, I just have to add the new lodge at the very bottom of the frame. And then that fits with what I've done because I've already arranged it by lodge charter year. And then the only thing I'd have to do then is then update the labels for the lodges that were the predecessor lodge that then got merged. So that's my best way I'm gonna to try to do this. Um, it's near about impossible to, to put a frame together and then the Boy Scouts not do something to mess you up. Unless you're doing something like Air Scouts or something that long ago, you know, doesn't exist anymore and, and there's, there's no new issues coming out. Um, kind of the same thing with council strips. You know, how would you arrange a council strip frame because you know there's going to be new councils and stuff like that. So anyways, I'm playing with that idea too. Council strips are going to be my next project. Um, I've got a big collection of council strips that need to get organized. But OA is kind of my passion, so this is what I wanted to start with first. So anyways, if you have some ideas for me, please share them in the comments of this video. I also would be curious if anybody else is trying something like this. I recently uh, heard from Hank Birdsong, a friend of mine who lives in Western North Carolina. He's actually going to start trying to do a uh, OA First Flap collection, which is very ambitious. So again, I sort of say to all of you that you have the power to decide how you want to arrange your collection. What do you want to collect? Uh, I've made decisions here that some of you would question. Some of you would say, oh, that's crazy. I wouldn't do it that way. But this is how I, how I want to do it for my own collection. And uh, I'm in charge of my own collection. So that's just fine. Jason Spangler, the Santee Swapper. Check me out on my website, scoutpatchcollectors.com. I have lots of other videos that you can find there, some reference material as well. I put out a newsletter. I put out a podcast. I put out videos like this to kind of support the scouting memorabilia hobby and keep the flame going. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.